Welcome to another episode of Higher Education, a weekly consultation on all things climbing related. Uh, I'm, your, I'm your host, Andy Kirkpatrick. Uh, you're going to have to, um, I apologise, you might be able to pick up a kind of weird noise, like a, but it's my uh, next door neighbour, who I think is actually having a, some kind of nervous breakdown because he just spends a, a lot of time um, on his turbo at the moment. That's not a... That's not a small thing that goes into like a, a sports car, but actually a bike turbo, you know, where you stand on a, sit on a bike and you go around in your living room. Or oh, you don't go around, uh, you just stay in the same place. Uh, he was like, he was doing it this morning at like, like half past four in the morning. He was on his fucking turbo. And um, I, I would go around there and like tell him to stop it, but he's like, he's, he's like pretty fit. Like he spends his whole time on his turbo. So I'll just, uh, ignore it so if it sounds like if it sounds like you can if you can hear it in the background see if you can hear it there's also that's the car beeping beeping <laughs> anyway hopefully you can't hear it i'll just keep i'll just keep speaking over it so um it's gonna go faster now i bet you can hear you probably can hear me um, so um uh uh so i was thinking actually i should explain who i am someone told me today how his wife was listening to this podcast, uh, even though she wasn't a climber, and she was very interested in uh, Prusik loops, even though she didn't know what Prusik loop was. So I better kind of, exp maybe I thought I'd ex explain like who I am. Um, so my name's Andy Kirkpatrick, and uh, uh, I, won't go, I won't go into the whole biographical, autobiographical details, uh, but I um, uh, come from the UK. I'm a climber type person. Um, I've been climbing since I was uh, five years old. Uh, I have this hat. I can't, I've got to get out of this habit of speaking like her, like an Australian, and everything sounds like it's a question. Um, anyway, so I've been climbing since I was about five years old. Uh, I always sort of see myself as a mountaineer. And the first kind of proper climbing I did was climbing like in uh, in the Alps. Like, I only I only ever climbed in the Alps in the winter time for some reason. So I've done like lots of like hard route, like you know, North Facey. North Face kind of things uh, in the Alps, uh, the Drew and the Dwats and all that kind of stuff. Uh, been to Patagonia uh, like five times, uh, all, always in the winter for some reason. Uh, been to Alaska uh, in the winter, um, Antarctica, Greenland, all those kind of places. But I'm, I'm mainly known as being a big wall climber, really. I've kind of got pigeonholed as that, really. Like if, if, you, t if you go and do... A, like a climbing festival or whatever, people are always like, "Oh, there's not, there's no big wall routes around here, or there's no aid climbing." Like, I don't actually, I'm not actually like aid climbing. It's just something. Like, I, I did a route on the, I did the Drew Couloir on the the backside of the, around the side of the Drew, and it had like an aid pitch on it, and I was like so terrible at it. I thought like, "Oh, I need to learn how to do um, aid climbing." So I ended up going to Yosemite and climbing El Cap. Uh, well, I ended up climbing El Cap, El Cap like 30, about 35 times and I've soloed it like five times and climbed it in a day and all that kind of stuff. But not on, not on, the, not on the same trip. Um, but uh, so, yeah, so it seems I've got like pigeonholed as being an aid climber. But I always see, see myself more as a mountaineer and uh, I've climbed a lot in the winter, like ice climbing, uh, mixed climbing, sort of climbed like Scottish grade eights and, and things. And... Uh, but my what I'm what I'm really not amazing at is uh, rock climbing. Uh, well, I won't say I won't say I'm amazing. I used to work in a shop where everyone was climbing like E7 and E8 and and harder. So I always felt like I was a really shit rock climber. But I'm, I'm basically I've always been climbing the same grade, which is sort of five ten, which kind of in the UK goes from what, hard VS to E3, depending on um, how much I've I've been climbing. So I kind of have a, like a quite a unique. Uh, you know, unique ability to 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 be like an average climber who's kind of climbed like, you know, like routes which aren't kind of average. So I've like done like new routes in, you know, like Antarctica, like, you know, big walls, which like super hard climbers have done. And I've managed to do new routes and, uh, you know, soloed like routes that really good climbers would solo. And uh, anyway, so I don't know why. I Like my, my uh, someone said what I should do, like my really good thing would be like skiing to the South Pole or crossing Antarctica or rowing across the Atlantic, but they all they all require like a shitload of money. So uh, I just stuck to climbing and um, 
you know, made <laughs> made something out of that. Uh, often people think I've retired from climbing because I don't actually look like a climber. If you met me, I'd look like I was a, a builder or something. I've not really got the physique of like some sort of... I've got, uh, Someone said I'm, I'm like a... Uh, a uh, wolf in sheep's clothing, which what he, what he ma- really meant was I'm, I'm a big fat bastard who's actually quite good at climbing. Uh, also, someone said I was like a bumblebee in that I, I look like I shouldn't be able to fly, but I, but I can. And uh, but really, my, my what I'm really good at is um, is not dying. That's you know I, I don't want to I don't want like jinx myself, but anyway, I'm I'm, I'm kind of good at suffering. So usually. W- like if it's if it's really really good conditions and it's like brilliant climbing, then you know Adam Ondra's gonna, you know, could be much better than me. But um, you know, but if it was like raining and snowing and hit, and we'd not had any food for like you know a week and we'd not had any water and uh, we both had you know, then I'd pr- probably be better than him. You know, so you know, fingers crossed one day that'll happen. So I, I am I am still climbing, uh, uh, climbed probably like every single. Every other day last year, like climbed, spent like three months in Australia climbing and blah, blah. I don't want to sound like I'm like blow me on trumpet, but I am actually still climbing. Uh, the last big thing I did, tried to, tried to climb Denali uh, this uh, last winter in, in um, February. I got up to Camp 5 and we ran out of food and it was really exciting, minus 50 and all that kind of rubbish. And uh, currently living in the Middle East, uh, which is very flat, so there's not much climbing here. That's why I probably do it. Doing this podcast, so I can talk about it. Um, so yeah, so, so that's, that's who I am. So if anybody wants to know, I'll just get them to listen to this bit of the podcast and, uh, and I make a living, uh, at the moment I make a living writing and, uh, doing all, all sorts of weird work, like a, an assassin and that kind of stuff. I always, you always have to be careful really. Cause I, I used to tell people I was an assassin and then one day I actually met a real assassin and, uh, yeah, that's another story. So, uh, so I've got a mixed bag of questions this week. So this is the this is a so the this podcast is called Psycho Vertical. This is higher education. This is like a little subset of podcasts where I just answer really inane questions. Um, I was going to talk about um, lanyards this week, uh, uh, you know, but uh, I've I've got quite a few questions this week. So I actually have a lot of questions, but I can't find them all because you get these days in the in the old days, you know, you just get a you know, handwritten telegram, um, you just get an email and you can just have all your emails. But now you've got like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and, you know, and like unverified things. And so you just got all these things everywhere. So, so this is like, it's like a mixed bag of questions and I'll just, I'll kind of go through them. So, um, so the first one is, hi, Andy, we're planning on climbing the nose uh, in a three man team. The leader we the leader will have ladders, which are aid climbing things like aiders, uh, but we are considering for the second and third climber to ascend the rope using Yates stirrups. Would that make sense? There are a few traverses and the stirrups are fiddly to use on traverses, but all doable. I cannot think of any other disadvantage, but I was hoping you could tell me. So, so basically, if you're going to climb a big wall, uh, like I wrote this book last last year, year before, Higher Education, which is almost like an autistic person's big wall book in that it's like covers, you know, it covers every single thing you could ever want to know about big wall climbing. And, he, and, and a lot of stuff you wouldn't want to know, like it goes to such minute detail, it even includes the weight and the volume of, sh- of shit a human being produces. It was actually quite important. If you can do like a, a wall and you're going to be on it for like, two weeks and there's like four of you, you need to kind of calculate how much shit you're going to produce because you have to carry it with you up the wall. Um, I, when I wrote this book, I, I kind of just wrote, I just wrote it over like a year and I just like every, and I climbed El Cap about five times while I was writing it. So it just kept getting, every time I'd cl- climb it, I would think of more things and just keep adding it. And then I created the document and then it was like printed, uh, so people could buy it and um but i couldn't i never actually saw the book until i i was away and then when i came back you know i i i got a copy of my own book and i looked at it and it was like christ almighty this looks like a book that a crazy person would write like it really is really 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 detailed uh so someone said to me the other day like like oh you, you well you know you put all that effort into that book and then but basically people don't don't go aid climbing anymore so it was a bit of a waste of time but the thing about big wall climbing is it's actually a growth industry in that 
Yeah, like even on a lot of uh, really hard aid routes, uh, really hard free climbing routes, people actually aid up the pitches before they actually free them. Um, but basically the book is primarily not so much about the aid climbing. It's more about uh, like hauling, bivouacking, uh, cleaning, uh, you know, alpine walls um, and, all, and all that kind of stuff. So, so, the, so these guys... So usually when you're doing a big wall, like the nose and El Cap, uh, for that you either have, you can have a system where you only have one daisy chain or one like lanyard, which is like the thing that's going to connect you in, and one and one aider, which is like a you know, nylon ladder. And that's that's quite a good system. And you can do, have variations of it where the ladder is attached to a Fifi hook and that Fifi hook is attached to you with some like strong cord. And it means that you can hook it onto a piece of gear do the move and if you're like going into a free climbing move the 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 aid just is lifted lifted off as you climb above it which is a like european sort of style um you know like old-fashioned dolomites kind of technique uh which is which actually works really well for like very like mixed climbing because on the nose a lot of it you can free climb it uh, or it's like really easy aiding really and often you want to be able to like suddenly go from like standing in an aider to standing on a foothold to to grabbing hold of a cam and that's that's the way you kind of climb it quickly um but most most people don't generally have two lanyards two adjustable lanyards usually like a, a petzl uh, like a just or something and two aiders and it means that they can kind of leapfrog the aiders when they're aid climbing and uh, when they're uh, dumaring, because it, it's not very steep, the nose. It's steep at the top, but the bottom isn't it's very steep. A lot of the time, you're just actually just standing in your aders and you're like stepping up on your aders. You're not actually weighting your harness at all. You kind of, uh, you know, like one of those like um, stepping machine type things you used to get. Like uh, you're just like going up a ladder, really. So it's really important to have two aders. If you only got one ader, like it's, uh, you know, it's like a, you waste a lot of energy. So. So he, he's like saying, is it worth the other people having this thing that Yates make? Like Yates make basically like industrial gear and like big wall gear. And they have a thing, it's like a foot loop on the on the bottom and then it's a, an adjustable foot loop. So you've got this like bit your foot goes into. There's actually, you can strap your foot in so your foot doesn't come out. And then it goes up into a, like an adjustable um, length sling. So you can just like fine tune it. And it hasn't got all these steps which you, which you can... Um, get in the way and stuff and you can just adjust it as you're actually going up on the on the things and not having your foot coming out is kind of handy when you're first starting out uh how you stop your foot coming out of an aider generally is some aiders like the 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 normal the ladder aiders that aids make i think they're called easy aiders are, are quite good in that they're um they have like a piece of elastic that's that's underneath the step so when you're standing in the step you can put the elastic around your foot and it keeps it in but once you get into dumaring you generally what you do is you're as you're putting as you're moving the the your the aider up and the jumar, you just press you just keep your a tiny little bit of weight on the aider, um, so it stops. So you're kind of lifting your foot up with your with the handle a little tiny little bit. So it keeps your foot in the aider. But you know, if you climb El Cap by the time you get to the top, you're quite good at all this kind of stuff. Uh, but it's always good, like someone is always gonna drop something. So I would say that. If, if you're in a team of three, basically one person climbs, one person climbs up the lead line, taking all the gear out, and the other person uh, climbs up the whole line, and then the whole bag's lowered out and uh, and it's hauled up. So so the 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 person going up the whole line, they don't really need like full sight, they don't, don't really need aiders. So the foot loop is quite good. You can just make a foot loop out of some webbing if, if you want really uh but it's always good to have like two sets of aders because if you drop an ader then you can just like send up one of the other aders so uh like always always you always want some kind of um uh, redundancy so hopefully i answer that question um so here's another one this is like a clothing type one hi andy i just i know you get tons of gear questions but just wondering what your thoughts are on polar tech alpha direct tops compared to the old style pile pertex, pertex garments or micropile, i.e. dry climb, vaporize, etc. All the best, James. So I've written a few articles on my website uh, about uh, dry, um, soft shell and the the original kind of the mod, the, the mod, well, not the modern, but like the, the original proper 
soft shell, I would say was like the Buffalo sh- Buffalo Mountain Shirt, which was a is a piece of clothing still exists. It's a piece of cl- clothing that came out in the '90s by a guy called Hamish Hamilton, who also designed the Van Gogh Force Ten Ten. And uh, Hamish was like a an absolute genius uh, guy, like really like one probably one of the most interesting people I've met. Like he was just he's he just like totally came at this idea of staying comfortable, completely different to everybody else. And he um, basically, I think he'd been living in Baffin Island or something. I think he was in the RAF. He was like a radar operator. And he'd I think he'd seen uh, Inuit. So now how an Inuit would uh, wear clothing, you know, because an Inuit's like in a very uh, tough environment, like staying comfortable in like really cold temperatures is, is really, really easy. Like it's actually really easy to stay, temp- stay warm at like minus 50, more so than it is at like, you know, minus five or plus five. But the Inuits, they actually wear like very thick uh, clothing uh, with nothing underneath. And basically, as soon as they had to do anything really physical, like run around or whatever, they would like almost like strip off. So they could just dump all this heat out where this kind of European kind of idea uh, where you had all these like layers and layers and layers of like wool and cotton and, uh, you know, gabardine and all these kind of fabrics uh, that that was, was very hard to like dump um uh, dump the moisture so a lot of i tend to find the reason why a lot of people get really cold and hypothermic in the mountains is not because they haven't got enough clothes on it's because they've they've got too many clothes on and the clothes just become like totally saturated so so hamish like basically he basically uh used fiber pile so fiber pile is not the same as fleece so fiber pile in it's got like because it's like a fur, like the actual tips of the fiber pile when they touch your skin, you've actually got like something with a very large surface area with a very small contact, um, it's like surface contact to your skin. So with fiber pile, if you get like a piece of fiber pile and you get it completely soaking wet and then put it, put a fiber pile jacket on, if it's tight, then the, the actual tips of the pile will dry almost like instantaneously. But the actual body of the pile is still like soaking wet. Like if you, it'll feel totally dry, but if you like lean against something, all the water will just like appear in it. So, and because it, because your skin's dry, um, it, it's warmer and then that heat ends up like pushing the, pushing the the water the moisture out of the fiber pile on, onto the onto the the larger surface area and then what the, what he did was he actually found this material called pertex and pertex is actually this made by the same people who used to make the ribbon for typewriters because a ribbon for a typewriter you know it, it just has one small piece of ink that is like sp- spread through um capillary action throughout the whole you know, through the whole ribbon. So basically, by by covering this fiber pile with 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 a ribbon, you know, like a, a large, a, a bigger version of like a, the ribbon from a typewriter. The, as soon as the moisture came close to it, it would just like spread out all the way across the fabric. So the the fabric would dry like incredibly quickly. So the buff, I think the buffalo shirt was the first. I think originally he came up with this material because he used it on the inners, inners of tents for Van Gogh, and it didn't. People just didn't really get it, and then he used it on the on the buffalo clothing. And I would still say, like when we're on Denali this year, um, you know, you're up there for. I think we're up there for like over a month, you know, in like really difficult. You know, stormy weather. Uh, you know, living in a snow hole the entire time, and basically we were wearing, uh, f- like, f- basically a, veg- a montane extreme um, kind of clothing, which is just basically like buffalo clothing, really, with some like slight differences. And I would still say like the the buffalo clothing because it's actually designed to be super simple. It's got very few anything that's going to going to hold moisture. So it doesn't have like reinforcing patches which hold moisture or or anything that's super, super lightweight is uh, still probably one of the best um, like high altitude, you know, cold weather uh, clothing you can buy. Like the high altitude solar pets have a zipper that goes like through the legs. Um, you know, it just is really easy to dump the heat uh, on that on that kind of clothing. But a lot of people in, it, but it looks shit. That's, that's, that's his biggest problem. <laughs> it looks like shit. And uh, so people don't want to look shit. 
And because it, because the main buffalo shell like goes over your head, it's like a pullover. You know, it's if you're in the pub, you know, you look a bit weird. And some like it used to be, but it used to be like a there was like a bit of a esprit de corps for people who wore, wore buffalo. And you know, like Doug Scott and Wojtek Kurtiker and uh, you know, a lot of like really good climbers actually wore uh, buffalo uh, because it just worked so well. And they might have to wear like you know, bag house, you know, super expensive jacket over the top, but it was actually like buffalo underneath. And, uh, but like Pat, so I went, I think I, I always keep mentioning this for some reason, but I, I work f- for Patagonia as a, as they had like some, like five, five gear testers. And I worked for Patagonia for a while. And when I was working for them, uh, I helped sort of develop um, the first, probably the first, well, not the first because they uh, well, one of the first, like, pr- like a buffalo esque um, piece of clothing for Patagonia, and I think the original jacket was, I think they called it like the Inferno, which was a kind of a bastardized version of it. It was like a, it was almost like a jacket like you'd wear in the car. Really, it was like long, you know, had a big hood and all, all that kind of stuff. And then they kind of uh, slowly tweaked it. And I think it was called, was it called the? Uh, scent or something it was actually a really good jacket they came up with a really really good really good jacket like people like steve house and people like that like really really uh, liked it there was like a yellow and gray one there was like a blue one earlier on and and that was like a really really good um really good a really good version of the jacket that worked worked super super well and with like with all things the patagonia and these kind of people you know you end up with a really really good product and then it, it goes for like two seasons and then it just disappears so uh, and there, but probably one of the best soft shell products is is still around, which is the um, ma- uh, Marmot Dry Climb Vaporize kind of jacket, which I'm sure lots of people have used or had. And uh, kind of a variation of that is the Rab uh, Rab kind of Vaporize. Is it Vaporize um, kind of jacket? And there was a few other people make. I think Montaigne were making one like that. And basically, it's what one of the best remains, one of the best bits of clothing that exists. But again, it looks a bit shit. So you know, brands you know like drop it or whatever. But the Rab one is the Rab one is is uh, is, is really good. I'm not really up on what's what's around at the moment. So I don't. I don't. I just should point out, I don't actually. I'm not actually sponsored by any clothing companies. So when I say this, I'm not like promoting any any brands. I'm just telling you like what I think. Um, but uh, so we're after the as this, I think as the as the uh, as Patagonia were like, I think I don't know if Patagonia came up with the the, the term soft shell. Like like Hamish called his like double P, which was pile pertex. But I, I suspect like Patagonia probably came up with a soft shell kind of idea. And although there were before that, there was a few of these membraned uh, gore and Polatec and variation duofold like um, w- windproof fleeces. And they kind of like jumped in on the bandwagon and you had all these like utterly shit kind of uh, items of clothing, which were saying they were like soft shell, uh, which they weren't really. Because as soon as you put like a membrane, like fleece is just a non-starter, really. For like for performance clothing, I think it's like a not a non-starter, really. It has to have like a sort of pile um, kind of construction, not a fleece construction. So, um, so yeah, she had all these like really shit, like, things that are supposed to be soft shell but as soon as you have a membrane in there it's not it's not going to work basically like if you get if you get a uh, if you make a, a shirt uh, out of like newspaper uh, it, it'll be rubbish <laughs> it's made out of newspaper but you'll realize that the sweat even though it's newspaper which is kind of breathable the sweat won't be able to get through it quick enough and it'll just get wet so um so that's why a lot of these soft shell they're basically it's soft shell as in if you're like uh you know if you're uh, delivering pizzas, you know, and you get out of your car and you have to go to someone's door, you know, it'll keep the wind out and it might even keep some like wet wetness out. But if you're going out on a on a mountain, uh, it's a complete waste of time. So don't, you know. So uh, Patagonia uh, and, and Polatec, they came up with like those like the R1 fleece and the R2 fleece and the R3 fleece, which were probably the point where they dropped the they dropped the the complete soft shell kind of system and they introduced you know they introduced this uh like a more of a layering system so you know because because that kind of r1 sort of fleece you know is is kind of cross between a fleece and a pile uh, actually it actually works quite well so if you've got like a 
a Patagonia R1 pullover and you have a like a Pertex windshell over the top of it, you find that it actually works, you know, works quite well. And if you have a, you know, so, so I'm sure most people have like used this kind of stuff, so you know what I'm talking about. So, but the, the, the next, the next kind of, I don't, know, I don't know if I call it a revolution because I've not actually ever used any, but the, the Polar Tex or Alpha Direct tops are, uh, it's, you know, you've got two layers of material, uh, sort of breathable material, and you've got this uh, very, um, very lofty sort of synthetic kind of, uh, um, you know, like a puff kind of insulation, but it's kind of spread out quite a lot. It's got a lot of space for moisture to pass pass through it, and that, that does look that does look uh, like it's it works quite quite well. Um, the only thing I'd question was how long, how robust it is, how long it would last before it starts um, thinning out. Like the thing about fiber pile is, like I used to have a javelin like fiber pile jacket. And the same with like some of the old Patagonia fiber pile jackets, which are from like the 1970s. Like they're still actually, they still work probably as well. You know, like 40 years, 40 years on, they're still, you know, 30, 40, is that 50 years? Anyway, 40 years on, they're still working the same. Where I doubt a Polartec Alpha Direct jacket is going to be still working after 10 years. So um, I, got, I, I was arguing with someone today about the use of the word eco. Uh, in uh, clothing uh, advertising, and it's a little bit like the word luxury. Is it's very, you can't really define what it is. Um, although luxury is the uh, the absence of vulgarity, but um, but eco is a. I said it was a bit like in the MSG of uh, of clo- of like marketing. You just sprinkle it on some product, and uh, you know basically all the all the the sweatshop workers in Vietnam were all wearing clogs. Therefore, it's an eco product, but. Uh, the the you know the the most important element of a product to be eco is it lasts a long time like ideally it lasts forever as in it lasts for the lifetime of the of the person so you know if you're buying a if you're buying a a lightweight rucksack that you know weighs like 500 grams but it's made out of like you know silk or something you know it's gonna it's gonna last you one year or two years but if you buy a sack made out of like ballistic nylon which is uh you know it's like a third heavier it will probably last you for like the whole of your life uh like this there's the straps will eventually like get a lot thinner but there is a way you you know you could design a sack which would last you you know for the whole of your life so so yeah so that's that's a i think that's a that's like an element i think should take into into account but the the upside of the of the Polartec Alpha is it's going to be a lot less bulky because that's the problem with the fiber pile is it's like really, really bulky. Um, it's good if you do a trip where you put it on and you don't take it off for a month. But if you're having to like take it on and off and, you know, it's getting hot and cold and things, it doesn't work as well as like a more traditional kind of layering system. But when, but when you want it to work, it's going to work uh, better than any anything else. So, um, so yeah, Um uh, another another clothing question. It was actually someone asking me. F- it was a long email. It was about uh, winter trouser ad- winter trousers advice. So basically, waterproof trouser advice. So I would say, if it comes to waterproof trousers, that pretty much they're all to a, to a degree they're all the same. Like nearly all of them are made out of uh, Gore-Tex these days, and they're all basically the same kind of Gore-Tex. Yeah, it might be pro this or whatever or you know shite text this but it's basically they're all going to perform pretty much the same and all of them are going to get ripped by crampons or ripped when you like fall over and you're sliding down your ass uh, in the past you could buy waterproof trousers which were made out of like taslan you know gore-tex taslan which was a super super tough uh version of gore-tex like it was kind of in it wasn't indestructible, it was pretty indestructible. And people would still keep wearing them even when the Gore-Tex had stopped working. And um, and uh, and the last ones I saw like that, I think Mountain Hardware made some like super, like in, you know, industrial strength trousers um, and, the, and, they, and they were pretty good. And a few, like a few people do come out with, you know, trousers which, have, which are kind of designed for like guides. So like Mammo, uh, might have some, um, you know, like designed to be, but they're but they're so tough that it's actually quite hard to sell them. 
you know, it's, 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 it's like tough to sell them because people are always obsessed with lightweight stuff because a lot of people aren't wearing waterproof trousers. They're wearing like soft shell, you know, like soft shell as in like shoulder kind of stretch, um, you know, windproof stretch kind of trousers. So only the, in Scandinavia, people wear, for some reason, they wear the waterproof trousers the whole time. You know, when you're setting off and it's dry, they've got the waterproof trousers on, which is a bit weird. So, but even even then, they're all they're all kind of much of a muchness, I think. And I would just because they're so like I, I usually I probably get through like one pair of waterproof trousers a year, and I always uh, like I repair them. I use like seam grip, and I try and try and like you know like the best bit it gets so holy that it's kind of not worth repairing them anymore. But I, I tend to get ones which are light enough that I, I can carry them in my bag without having to worry about it too much. And I'll only put them on when it's like pretty bad. And I'll try and wear trousers. I often wear like sort of Pertex trousers, which which dry super quickly. And I'll wear them over like Brynja, like mesh underwear, which doesn't matter if it gets wet because it's mainly air. Um, but if you were doing some, like I, I actually, the last pair of trousers I bought were actually German army trousers which are uh, Gore-Tex and they're super tough and they're, uh, they cost about 35 quid. And like the, ger- the, ger- the amount of testing and the amount of art thought that went in goes into like German army kit. Like it's a bit weird I'm telling you about buying army surplus kit, but it's actually, I would highly recommend like if you can, if you can, if you can like if you, if you can buy a pair, pair offline, um, buy them like a little bit bigger than you think because they're only 35 quid and they're actually really, really good. And they actually look quite cool because they're like a weird kind of German army pattern. Um, don't, I probably won't buy any British army ones. They're probably crap. Uh, another like another bit of clothing I've actually bought in the past, speaking of army surplus stuff, is they have this cold weather kind of layering system like the US uh, military. And they actually do like a really good fleece and they actually do a really good synthetic like Das Parker and like Das Parker kind of synthetic leg uh, trousers which are like a, they're like a bee laying you know bee laying you know extreme cold kind of lay they're not for like normal climbing and they do like a waistcoat as well it's all unfortunately it's all green or like a gray color but it's uh if you got if you're like if you're a bit skin uh, i suspect that that some bits that might be made like in the past like people like wall things and patagonia and people like that have made stuff for the u.s military so so it's, you, you can actually get some quite good uh quite good deals really um so yeah the if, if someone if someone asked me like what are the best waterproof trousers you can buy like if you were living somewhere where it was like raining the entire time and uh you know like living in like ireland or you know some sort of scandinavian country i would probably say paramo trousers uh which is if some people don't know what paramo is but it's basically like a version of like I think Hamish Hamilton and uh, the guy from Paramore they actually had some dealings at the beginning of Paramore and they went in different directions but it's basically this this sort of slight pile very micro pile fabric with a with a like windproof very breathable uh, water resistant outer to it and you know Paramore is like works really really well and the only reason I'm not like super never like super keen on it personally is that it is a little bit heavy. So but it's ideal for, for people who want to put put the waterproof trousers on in the morning and like wear them all day long. So yeah, so Paramo is uh, is is worth checking out. So uh, uh, final question. He's still on his turbo, so I'll see. I'll just get this one. So um, uh, uh, all right. So it's hi Andy. Hope you're well. I was wondering if you might do a podcast about extra measures or precautions you can take if there's a big difference in weight between you and your partner and in brackets he wrote climbing not in the bedroom although thinking about this it would be quite funny quite a funny subject um i don't know anything about having sex with someone who's a different size to me um i shouldn't say that because my wife will think i think she's a big fat bastard um getting the perfect partner requires compromises so this is probably an issue for quite a lot of climbers thanks matt um, please don't tell anybody my full, my first name. Okay, Matt. So, um, yeah, uh, it's a, it, yeah, it's a, it's kind of a, it's a tricky one. You do see people climbing and you're like, God, if that guy falls off, that woman's just going to get like, it's generally, it's generally men and women. It's not usually, it's not usually the woman who's like a giant and the man's like a tiny person, unless he drinks a lot of soya milk. Um, yeah, like the, the the most obvious the most obvious thing is like don't fall off. Um, a lot of trad climbers uh, don't fall off, 
And then when they do fall off, they generally kind of shocked, uh, like what what happens. Uh, I, remember, I remember once doing a route, is it left, left unconquerable on Stanage? And I was I was climbing up there. This friend of mine, Jez, who is like, he must have weighed like, you know, like seven stone or something. And I probably weighed like 12 stone. Uh, I was quite thin then. And I was like lay backing up the thing. And I think I had like a cam in and then I put another cam in. And I was right near the top and I, was, and I reached up into where the, the handhold was and it was full of water and my hand just like slipped off and I fell and like Jez just came like flying up and we ended up like literally like eye to eye with each other. Like he was halfway at the wall. Um, but usually you don't really find out. So so the, the first thing is, is if you're climbing with someone who's lighter than you, they have to wear a helmet because the chances are that... It, if you don't if you don't do things properly, then they're probably going to go like flying either into the wall or up the wall. And if they hit something while they're going into the wall or up the wall, there's a good chance they're going to like let go of the rope, and uh, then you'll both basically come back down again. So it's uh, that that's not good. So wear so wear a helmet. Um, consider like anchoring the person to the wall, like even if it's a single pitch, single pitch route or whatever. Like try and set up a belay. Uh, where they're safe. Um, there's a device called an a pe- a, an Edelrid OHM or OM, uh, OM um, which I'm sure you've probably checked out already, uh, where the rope runs through it. And it's basically like a, well, it's a bit like a cleat, I think, in that you clip it to the first bolt. And if you, f- if you fall, then the OM like takes up a lot of the, um, a lot of the friction and it stops the, it stops the rope from, uh, it stops the person from being pulled up. But that's really on it. It's only unless you're going to do like trad routes on a single rope, which I which I don't tend to recommend. I think you're always best with a double rope. Then um, then it's it's probably not. It's probably you know it's like only really good for sport climbing or climbing. If you're climbing if you're climbing indoors, like you you should really get an one of these things. Uh, if you're climbing indoors, you can always like make sure the the wall has got a uh, like um, points to clip into the floor or like bags, you know, weight bags, you know. Um, which which work work quite well. So if you but what if you if you're trad climbing, and uh, like I don't know if I think when you trad climbing if you've got two ropes, I, th- I think you tend to actually, I think the weight is actually not quite so bad because it's been is it being spread over two ropes or two anchors two runners when you fall off I don't know maybe I seem to I seem to think it's not as bad as when you have got a single rope. Uh, the, well, there's more the 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 impact the impact. The impact force is lower because it has the ropes stretch more, so that it has more time to absorb the weight of you falling. But even then, you're probably going to get pulled up. But the probably the best advice if you're going to do like trad climbing is actually just to do like a direct B layer, um, either using a uh, a Munter hitch, like an Italian hitch. If you've got two ropes, uh, or you can just like clip the B layer device like straight into the into the into the B-layer. So basically, um, you know, basically you build your, build your B-layer and you know, like when you, when you use a guided B-layer device and you're bringing someone up, it's like clip direct, direct into the B-layer. You just do that. Uh, so the B-layer, you're not, you got it in B-layer mode and you're B-laying the, the leader, but the ro- the B-layer device is actually attached to the anchor and then you're attached to the anchor as well. And you need to, pl- you need to have the anchor so it's good for an upward pull. Uh, just that, like it, yeah, it has to be it has to be good for an upward pull. So the the classic case would be, you know, if you if you were doing like kind of a route with like bolt belays, that's kind of semi trad. You know, you would just, um, you know, you kind of clip into both bolts, and then you would have the the belay device clipped into the one of the bolts. So you directly onto that bolt, uh, backed up to the other bolt, and you're backed into both bolts, and you would just feed the rope up like that. And it actually works. It actually works really, really well. Like if you climb with like German climbers, Austrian climbers, uh, those kind of people, they uh, not so much nowadays, but in the past they always used to be there, offer like a monter hitch. And the monter hitch is not going to twist your rope as long as you know how to use it properly. And it's not going to twist your rope if you're not, you know, if you're not like loading it. So it has a lot of uh, a lot of advantages. So it's something you you should play around with. Um, the final thing you should do is wear get the get the B layer to wear some kind of gloves, which is a good idea, uh, like leather gloves. They're very sexy, and uh, and also you know like some kind of if you if you're gonna B layer like off your harness like indirectly, 
Uh, is that indirectly? Yeah, indirectly. I can't think. Is that an indirect beal? I can't remember now. Anyway, so if you're going to beal off your harness, then it might also be worth considering using some kind of auto locking uh, belay device, either like a gree gree, or if you got if you're using double ropes, like some other kind of double rope locking device, because there is that you know when you're being like accelerated upwards into into the into the wall. Um, there's a good chance that people actually do let go of the rope and like put their hands out to protect themselves. Depends how much, how much they love you. So yes, so um, so yeah. Oh, yeah, I had one last one last question from uh, from Dave. This was from YouTube. Uh, God, it sounds like a professional, don't I? Dave from YouTube. Um, <laughs> usually, people on YouTube just say like something like really, really bizarre. So um, about uh, um, I get I, I went climbing with Alex Jones uh, and a people a lot of people actually thought it was the other Alex Jones but it wasn't it was the other Alex it was the Alex Jones so um, so this was a question of do you want do you have to use a is it worth using a Prusik backup when rappelling with a gree gree because um, if you let if you're busy you know if, if you let go with a gree gree it's going to lock up. Um, lock up automatically now this is one of these questions where if you asked it on a forum people would be like oh what a stupid question like of course you don't need to use a blah, 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 blah. so it, it kind of depends um it's like oh like people have died uh on el cap for example where they went to repel and the grigri wasn't clipped into their harness so they just fell you know they just went so although the grigri does lock up um it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that you're actually a clip to your harness. Where when you use a belay device and you use a back and use a prusik loop as a backup, um, it means that even if your belay device isn't clipped into your harness, you're not going to die. So I tend to I have like use a grigri a lot for abseiling and things when you're on a big wall, and it, it tends to, I tend to um, I tend to be very careful when I'm just using a grigri because I tend to always use a backup when I'm using a belay device, and I tend to prefer to just use my belay device my to repel on. But if I am using a grigri, uh, like sometimes you, you want to like sometimes it's easy to like repel down on your grigri and then just kind of like you know use one juma on the grigri to go back up again if you you know if you're going up and down really quickly. But if I was if it was dark or I didn't wasn't really sure what I was doing or if it was like bad weather or there was a reason where there's a chance where I could like make a mistake and not have the, the like I, I think if you listen to my second podcast which is called like how not to kill yourself or staying alive or something is you know twice in my life I've actually abseiled on a on a you know significant drop where the the carabiner wasn't actually clipped to my harness. It was just kind of semi-hooked onto the belay loop, you know, and the gate was open and somehow it somehow it stayed on. So, yeah, so I, I, I don't think it's that uh, such a daft question. Uh, like, if you're going to use it with a grigri, you'd probably have to put the Prusik loop on your leg or you'd have to have the Prusik loop, like, an, like extended a little bit because you can't really extend a grigri. It has to really kind of be on your on your belay loop. Um, so you'd have, the Prusik would have to be, be above, but... Um, yeah, it's not it's not as daft and I, it's not as daft as it as it sounds really to to you know to to just it's just that make it just like you know if you when you're abseiling over the top of El Cap and it's a thousand meter drop, uh, although although you know that you you know like you should always you should always really have two points of contact um, to into the rope, and the grigri is the one thing where it, tan, it, it often like breaks that kind of rule. So having like two points is is probably not. You know, really stupid because, like, you know, a grigri, like a, I've seen one grigri which where it broke, where it basically got like twisted in a weird way, and the 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 um the thing broke off where the where the rope goes through it, so the the clipping sort of point broke off it. So, you know, like, it, you know, these things can happen. And also, uh, I will admit that several times I've abseiled on a grigri and had the rope through the wrong way around, uh, which is kind of kind of worrying when you kind of realise when it's too late. So just having that having that extra point is is uh, is where is a good idea. Um, you know, like if you had the if you had it above the grigri, then that gives you that, that tiny little chance that if you were to abseil off your rope, uh, that prusik would like might stop you if you didn't didn't grab hold of it and pull it down with you. So anyway, so on that cheery note, I shall uh, I shall sign off and um, and send in your questions. Uh, ideally, email me at andy at cyclevertical .com. Um, uh, share this podcast blah 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 and <laughs> and all that kind of stuff so anyway so um, 
I shall uh, do another podcast uh, Thursday, maybe. Okay, bye.